Y'all open with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one off the pew back in front of you there or uh, bring it up on your phone if you can look at it on your phone without getting distracted. Um, And let me just remind you, I need to take a second and just kind of mention this. You know, there's different, everybody here is on a different level as far as their journey with with the Lord. And uh, I was always one that was less educated as I sat in the pew. And so sometimes they would say, get your Bible out and turn to this book. And I'd say, I have no idea where that book is. If that's you, you're in good company, okay? That's what I'm trying to tell you. Um, Feel free to to open up to the index right there at the beginning of the Bible, right before the book of Genesis. Look and find the book of Hebrews and, and take your time finding the book of Hebrews if you need to. Um, this, is, this is how we learn, you know, and, and if, if you need to, ask somebody next to you. Maybe they can help you find it. But uh, let's, let's get serious about understanding God's Word together. Today's sermon is, uh, is the lab, and I'll tell you what I'm talking about. When you take classes in college and maybe some high school classes, some of those classes have two parts to them. There's the classroom part, and then there's the lab part. And the classroom part is where you open up the books, and you learn the theories, and you you memorize, and you listen to the teachings, and you fill your head with knowledge. And then you take that knowledge, and you bring it to the lab, where you put it to work with your hands. Well, that's what we're looking at today. You see, in in virtually all of the the epistles of the New Testament, the letters of the New Testament, it kind of has a classroom part and a lab part. There's a part where it's just teaching, teaching theology. Who is God? Who is man? How does man relate to God? And then that'll take place for however many chapters in in the book, and then at some point it gets to, and this is what you do with it. Now you know it, this is what you do with it. Well, we're to that point now in the book of Hebrews. Uh, We've been, we're nine and a half chapters in, and we've been learning who Christ is, who God is, who we are, how Christ is greater than all that we can hope or imagine. Uh, And then now we're going to get to a point where the author of Hebrews says, and this is what you do with it. This is how you get to work based on what you know. Um, And so kids, here's your assignment for today. Here's what you can look for uh, as you listen to the sermon today, kids. It's going to be a two-part sermon. The first part of it is kind of a recap of just remind the author reminds us how great Christ is and three things that Christ has done that make him so great. And this is the part I want you to keep up with, kids. It's about halfway through the sermon. It's what we need to do. So based on who Christ is, there's three points, three things that we do as Christians. And I want you to keep up with those points, and maybe you can tell them to your parents after the sermon. Maybe you can talk about it in the car on the way home. Now, as we get ready to go and study God's Word together, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. God, we thank you that you have given us so much in your revelation, where you revealed yourself through your written Word. God, open our eyes to your truth. Humble us before your truth. Build our minds in a way that will motivate us to do your good work in this world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You'll have to excuse me. This is what we need to do. Be reminded of the great work of Christ. So we're getting, like I said, it's kind of a summary. That's not going to work. But kind of a summary here the author gives us is a reminder of some of the things he's been through. And the first thing we're seeing is that Christ was the greater sacrifice. This is what we preached on. This is what I preached on last week. Um, So in verse 5, the author says this. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come, Jesus saying, I have come to do your will, O God as it is written of me in the scroll of the book, as I was testified in the Old Testament. So verses 5 through 7 are a quote from Psalm 40. And then in verse 8, the author of Hebrews explains what that quote is supposed to mean. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, 
These are offered according to the law. So the law there would be the Old Testament law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. So he's doing away with the Old Testament sacrificial system in order to uh, establish a new, te- a new sacrificial system based on one sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ. We see that in verse 10. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all once for all this is incredible this is incredible it it reminds us of what we talked about last week all of your attempts you just saw it in the little video right all your attempts to pay for your sins they're meaningless they're pointless um they're futile even the old testament sacrificial system was not meant to be a permanent solution it was only meant to show people how inadequate we are to pay for our own sins. So, you know, day after day after day having to sacrifice animals and sacrifice animals and keep doing this and keep doing this, and you can imagine they'd be saying, like, when is this, when's it going to be over? When's this going to be enough? You, you can picture, um, picture being in a leaky boat and having a bucket and just having to bail out your boat, right? And the boat's leaky, so it's a never-ending task and now that might keep your boat from sinking um but really what it's doing is it's showing you how insufficient that bucket is and and it's going to get you to a point where finally you're going to call out and say would somebody come fix my boat and that's the whole idea of the old testament sacrificial system they're going with somebody's got to fix this We, we we must be absolutely terrible if we are just constantly having to make these sacrifices, would somebody come and just be the ultimate sacrifice to pay for our sins once and all? And Jesus says, that's me. I am the greater sacrifice. And the author is reminding us of this. And it's as ridiculous for us then and now to try to pay for our own sins as it would be to sit there and try to bail out a dry boat that has already been fixed. Pointless. We already have the one and for all sacrifice. And so, in the Old Testament, there was a a person who offered these sacrifices. And this person that offered the sacrifice was the priest. And they had a high priest that was over all of them, right? So, um, the Old Testament sacrificial system was insufficient, And the Old Testament high priest was insufficient. So just like we needed a a new, better sacrifice, we need a greater high priest as well. So that's what the author is reminding us, that Christ is a greater high priest. This is all his work. Verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ has offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins... He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. This is incredible. Jesus Christ, the high priest, the Old Testament high priest were imperfect men offering imperfect offerings that could not atone for the sins of the people. And Jesus comes in and he does it with one foul swoop. One action pays for all sins for all time. And that action was him stretched out, nailed to a cross. His body broken for you and for me. The high priest offering the ultimate sacrifice, which is himself. He, the priest, offering himself as a sacrifice. And when he did... Remember, we talked about this several times. Remember what he said in John while he was on the cross? It is finished. Tetelestai. It's over. It's done. And Jesus says, uh, like here, when it talks about making his enemy his footstool, he says, all the sin and all the death and Satan and all the corruption and all the foul stuff and all the rotting things and all the smelling things of this world, right? I've conquered them. They're done. I've conquered them all. And it's as if God himself took the seed of woman 
and smashed the head of the serpent. That was the cross. That was the high priest. Now, we're thinking people in here, right? And so we think it doesn't really seem like all the sin and corruption and all the foul and smelly things of this world have been taken care of, does it? We still have problems. And the author talks about that right there. So you notice in verse 12, it says that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. Now when do you sit down? When you're done, right? When you, when you finish the job, you sit down. It's complete. I'm in a good spot now. But then it says we're still waiting that his enemies should be made his footstool. So which is it? Did he do the job? Or are we still waiting for the job to get done? And the answer is yes. All right? It's like when you cut the head off of a snake. What happens to the body? Still wiggles, doesn't it? That snake is dead. He just doesn't know it yet. And that's where we live. That's the tension in which we live today, right? For the last 2,000 years, sin has been defeated its body is just wiggling. It just doesn't even know it's dead yet. And we're waiting for that final time when Christ returns, claims his church, and all tears, all pain, all sorrow is taken away completely and forever. There's another side to this too. So one side of it is that Christ took care of our enemies, right? Right? By the way, theologically, we call that the already but not yet. It's already happened, but it's not yet completed. But there's another side of the already not yet. So he's taking care of our enemies, but what about me? Is he taking care of me? And the answer is yes. All right, if you notice, in verse 14, it says, those who are being sanctified, right? To be sanctified means to be made holy. We are in a process of being made holy, but if you go back to verse 10, it says those who have been sanctified completed action so which is it am i already sanctified or am i in a process of being sanctified and the answer is yes <laughs> both you know what you are if you're a christian if you belong to christ you know what you are you are a chocolate cake sitting in the oven all the ingredients have been poured in the pan. Everything is perfectly mixed. It's all right in there. It's in the oven. The heat is set perfectly. The timer is set perfectly. The cake is done. The baker has gone back and is sitting down. He's just waiting for the, for the clock to ding. Right? That's what we are. You are a completed process of ongoing sanctification. If that makes sense, it's already, but just not yet. What a glorious thing our high priest has done for us. And so if you're noticing, these kind of flow out from one another. So it's a remind this is the work of Christ, okay? You are the work of Christ if you belong to him. And if you don't belong to him, I'm going to go on a limb here today. If you don't belong to him, you are Christ's work waiting to happen. You might be in here skeptical. You might have gotten drugged to church one day, uh, this day, right? You might have said, so-and-so made me come. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put something on you right now. I'm going to say God may be working in your heart, and he may be changing you and turning you and drawing you to himself right now. Now, I can't speak for God, but that's our hope. That's our hope. So Christ is the greater sacrifice. He's the greater high priest, and that comes with a promise, and that promise is Christ. He's the greater promise. Verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, uh, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. What the author is doing, author of Hebrew is doing here, Hebrews is doing here, is he is quoting Jeremiah 31. This is the second time he's quoted in this book. The other time you heard when we did Christ as a greater covenant. 
A covenant is a biblical word for a promise. And so if you're looking back at all the Old Testament promises, you're looking at these promises that God made, and then you get to Jeremiah 31 in the Old Old Testament, and it says, but there's a promise to come. There's a greater promise to come. And Jesus is saying, that greater promise is me. And the author of Hebrews is saying, that greater promise is me. And so we look at the covenant with God making with Adam and the creation, Adam and Eve. And he says, you're going to be the perfect humanity. Of course, we know what happened with that, right? Adam and Eve weren't the perfect humanity. Jesus says, I am. I am the perfect humanity. The the covenant with Noah, the Noahic covenant, that God is saying, I'm going to recreate everything. And it's going to be right this time. But it wasn't right that time, was it? So Jesus says, I am the perfect recreation. That's why we use terms for Christians that we are born again, right? He tells Abraham, you're going to be the father, all right, of the father of the Abrahamic covenant. Of course, we understand that Abraham was not a perfect father, and Jesus comes and says, I will play the role of the perfect father for you. And then the Mosaic Covenant to all the people of Israel, it says, you are going to be my holy nation. And we know that Israel failed and fell so many times. They weren't the perfect nation. And Jesus says, I am the perfect nation. I am the perfect fulfillment of the Mosaic Covenant. And of course, Jesus came to this Old Testament king named David and said, I'm going to make a covenant with you that your house will be forever course we know it wasn't david it wasn't his son solomon jesus says i am the perfect and eternal king now this is all at this point a history lesson it's interesting ideas remember we want to go from the classroom to the lab so what is it what is it that takes these historical facts and changes them what is the difference because an atheist can pick this book up they can go to uh you know books a million and buy a bible they can read it just like you can so what's the difference between an atheist reading this book and a christian reading this book verse 15 the holy spirit bears witnesses to us bears witness to us so this is what happens What is it that changes this from a bunch of facts about God to something that actually rearranges your life and your heart? It's the Holy Spirit, and this is what it is. It's God reaching into you and changing you from the inside out. And it's like when you you get high-speed internet at your house, and the guy comes and installs a modem there, and when he does, you're hooked into the web, right? And now, now you've got a, an unlimited stream going into your home, a connection with all the information of the world, right? That's what happens when, you, when the Holy Spirit works on your heart. It's like God installs his modem into your soul, and you have a connection with God. And all of a sudden, all these words that you've been reading for so long aren't just words anymore. You are hooked in to the author and sustainer of all creation and now this sacrifice that was designed to to pay for the sins of the world all of a sudden it's not just somebody's sacrifice it's my it was a sacrifice made for me do you hear me listen this is personal it's personal I'm going to say the word you, but I'm not saying y'all. I'm saying you, personally, individually, when you accept Christ, when the Holy Spirit works on your heart and you are a changed person, then his sacrifice is not just a sacrifice, it's your sacrifice for you. And, And he's not just the high priest, he's your high priest, interceding for you. And it's not just these promises that God made in history, it's a promise that God has made to you. It is written on your heart. And that's when you're called a Christian, a true follower of Christ. And this changes everything. It changes everything. And let me tell you something. This is the work of Christ. It's the work of Christ the perfect sacrifice 
the whole and eternal high priesthood. The, the promise that is sufficient for all time. This work, y'all listen to me, all right? It's, it's getting, we're getting close to lunchtime, so y'all might, let, me, let me liven things up a little bit. Anybody ever listen to The Clash? You know The Clash from the 70s, the punk band? Yeah, yeah. So you know what they said about The Clash in the 70s? They said it's the only band that really matters, right? Because they, were, they weren't just entertaining and good, they were political and they were supposed to change things in England and this and that, right? So what I'm going to tell you, forget The Clash for a second. What I'm saying is the work of Jesus is the only work that really matters, The work of Christ is the only work that really matters. You know why? Because everything else passes away. Everything. There's only one who overcame death. There's only one who paid for sins. You only have one high priest. It is his work that truly matters. And we we need doctors, for instance. People are still going to die. Everybody. You know, we need teachers, for example. Um, But you can't educate people out of sin. You can't. Uh, We need need lawyers, and we need bankers, and we need construction workers, and we need musicians, and we need coffee bean roasters. We need all these things. We need all kinds of professions. But they are lesser than, They are lesser profession. They're lesser work. Now somebody here is going, hang on now, I'm a coffee bean roaster. I'm talking about my profession here. We'll get to it, okay? I'll explain what I mean. It's the work of Christ that matters. Listen, Christ's work is greater than all, and all work is great in Christ. There's a famous poem, you've heard me quote it before from C.T. Studd. It said, but one life will soon be passed only what's done for Christ will last. So at this point, at this point you may be saying, I don't believe any of this stuff. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. And I ask, please come talk to me or come talk to Pastor Eric or Pastor Rick at the, at the next steps table out there after the sermon. Let's talk about where, where you're getting hung up on some of this stuff. But if you do believe what I've talked about so far, if you truly believe that Christ is the greater sacrifice, that he is the greater high priest, that he is the greater promise, then this is the work you do. All right? You let all your work in Christ be great. All of it in Christ. All your work in Christ. So listen. Verse 19 is the term. All right, this is, this is where you go from the classroom to the lab. And as a matter of fact, arguably in the whole book of Hebrews, this is the turn in verse 19 from theology to practice. From, from hearing and knowing to doing. And he says this, Therefore, brothers, therefore, right? Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. In other words, the sacrifice of Christ that made way for all people to be with God. This is the work of Jesus that is through his flesh. And since we have such a great priest over the, uh, great priest over the house of God, what the author of Hebrews here is doing is he's winding up for the pitch. And if you've been paying attention, if you've been listening, especially if you've been listening through the whole book of Hebrews, you're kind of like, okay, what? What? I got it. I believe it. Christ's work is great. Christ's work is better than anything in this world. What does that mean for me? What am I going to do? And and you're on the edge and you're saying, I'll do whatever I have to do. I believe it. I believe it. What do I need to do? And throughout history, you find all kinds of people asking that question. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Do you want me to keep the five pillars of Islam? I will. Do you want me to uphold the Torah? I will. Do you want me to... Uh, observe all the sacraments i will do you want me to go meditate under the bodai tree i will just tell me what work i need to do 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 i need to quit my job as a doctor and go be a missionary somewhere do i need to enter enter into mission do i need to go uh stop roasting coffee and and put on a big robe and go live in a monastery somewhere just tell me what i need to do what work 
can I do? And if that's you right now, you've missed everything. You've missed the whole point. It's not your work. Christ did the work. Christ did the work, and some people really, really have a hard time with this. As a matter of fact, this is what keeps, this is what keeps some people out of heaven because they don't want it to be Christ's work. They want it to be their work. They want it to be themselves that, got to, that, 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 that drug themselves up the mountain to God. Not that God came down from the mountain and rescued them through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's man's invention of religion. God's truth in Christ is that He came to you and He did the work. And then He said, My yoke, uh, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. So now, my point is, is there is work for you to do, but it's going to be so simple and it's going to be so easy, you may be mad at me. Don't be mad at me, be mad at God because He put it here. Here it is. All your work in Christ. What do you do first? Verse 22, you draw near to him. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. <clears throat> now that is very likely baptism imagery there. And the reason why baptism imagery helps us understand what it means to draw close to Christ is because you are just you are identifying with what Christ is and what He did for you. Right? It's like a, it's like if if, if a, a a great picture of a child drawing close to his or her father would be the child next to the father while the father works. Right? I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine a Polaroid shot of a dad out mowing the yard? And, and the kid next to him with their little plastic lawnmower with the bubbles coming out. And if you saw that picture, what would you say? Look how much that child loves his or her father. You see? Baptism is a picture of us saddling up right next to Christ. And just as Christ died for the sins of the world and was resurrected, we take someone in baptism and we lay them down in the water and they come back, back from new, in newness of life, a recreation. Remember the Noahic covenant? Recreated, reborn in Christ. Not that baptism saves, but it's a symbol, it's a picture of us drawing near, being close to Christ. And the second thing fl flies right out of it, falls right out of it. Not to say that baptism, let me, get, let me be clear on that. I'm not trying to say that baptism saves. I'm saying baptism is a picture that you have drawn close to Christ. And it, it's a one-time thing, and it's a forever thing, right? It's, it's you are being sanctified because you have been sanctified. So the second thing flows right out of that. You draw near to him, but you don't just draw near. You also hold fast. Hold fast to your confess, confession. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, again, I remind you like I remind you every week, the, the situation of the audience of Hebrews. They um, were tempted out of persecution to go back to their Jewish ways and turn away from Christianity because Christianity was very hard for them. It was hard for them to follow Christ. So the author is saying, you know, hold fast. Hold fast the confession. What is the confession? That Christ is greater. That he is the sacrifice we need. That he is the high priest that brings us into heaven. That he is the fulfillment of all God's promises. That it's Jesus. It's all Jesus. All Jesus. And now the temptation here and the difficulty for us here as we look at this early audience of Hebrews is to say, well, they were under, you know, persecution. Somebody might come and take their house from them. Somebody might exile them from their town. Somebody might kill them. And so it's easy for us on this air-conditioned Sunday morning with our padded pews to say, oh, yeah, if somebody put a gun to my head, of course I'd, I'd tell them I'd, I'm going to stand for Jesus, right? Even if you kill me, I'll stand for Jesus. But that's easy to say because you know that's probably not going to happen to you. So let me remind you what it means to hold fast. It means when your boss comes and says, I want to give you this job promotion, but you're going to have to tone down your Christianity a little bit. You hold 
hold fast. You don't waver on your confession. When there's a cute boy or a cute girl that finally asks you out, but you know they aren't where they're supposed to be with the Lord, right? You hold fast to your confession. Or maybe you're just in a difficult time in your life and you see a way out if you can just loosen your confession a little bit. Don't do it. Maybe you're just bored or you're tired of the mundane and you want some excitement. Hold fast to your confession. Do not give up what Christ paid for with his blood for you. Hold fast. And then the third thing follows out just from those two. Uh, You draw near, you hold fast. And if you're truly drawing near and you're truly holding fast, then the third thing makes so much sense. Help others do the same. Help others do the same. Look at verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day? The day (laughs) that the timer dings on the oven and Jesus comes back and gathers all his cakes. Christ is returning and he's going to grab his church and he's going to take us to heaven with him. Dead and alive. But how are we going to make sure that we're found faithful on that day? It's right here. How are you? One of the mechanisms that God in his divine sovereignty has put in place to make sure that you don't waver in your faith faith is the person sitting right next to you. It's your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why we don't neglect the gathering. And let me just say, if you're watching online, uh, there are some of you who are legitimately homebound and you, you, you just simply cannot make it to a church service here or another location, uh, another, another um, congregation. And if that's the case, praise God for this technology. Praise God that you're able to hear sermons and be fed with the word. But for anybody else who just, for whatever reason, doesn't want to come here and be with your gathered people, understand that you're missing out on a God-ordained opportunity. Now, we gather for a lot of reasons. The number one reason we gather is a collective proclamation of the goodness and glory of God. And as we are together proclaiming the goodness of God through the preaching of His Word and the reading of His Word, through the singing and the praying and the observance of baptism and the Lord's Supper, as we are doing this, it is a reminder to you, I am not alone. Tomorrow morning, a lot of y'all are going to go to work somewhere, and you're going to be alone there. You're going to look around, and you're going to think there's nobody in this world who follows Christ. But then you're going to remember, no, I was in a room full of them yesterday you encourage and other people encourage you it reminds me of elijah in first kings 19 when he was running in fear for his life from queen jezebel who was evil and he had just stood up to the prophets of baal who were following after this false god and elijah fell into this great depression because he felt like the world was coming down on him and he just it was so hard for him to remain faithful And God came and dealt with Elijah. And one of the things that God did with Elijah, he said, stand up. He said, turn around. There are 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. You are not alone. And so when we gather together, it's so that you can be encouraged in your faith. And it's so you can encourage others in their faith. There are people in this room that need you here. They need, even if you don't get a chance to speak to them, they need to see your body here calling out, praising God. It's a, it's a mechanism to keep you near to Christ and holding fast. Isn't that simple? Those are the three things. That's the work of Christ in your life. That's you working. This is your lab. Okay? So I'm not telling you you've got to get on a plane and head out to to Zimbabwe like we just had some that had returned. Um, I'm not telling you, you know, you we have we have great mission trips 
that go over to uh, work with our wisdom seekers in the, the mountains of, uh, of North Africa and the Mediterranean or the Middle East. I'm not saying that you have to do that because you're a Christian. Of course, we want everybody to grow in their faith. The things that you have to do, the work that you must do, draw near to Christ, hold fast your confession, and help others do the same. It sounds a lot like something we've already heard in Scripture. The great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, love your neighbor as yourself. The Great Commission, go and make disciples, love God, teach other people to love God. Now, I've been a Christian since I was about 12 or 13 years old, so for the past 31 years, as of yesterday, <laughs> I've seen a lot of people in this world who claim the name of Christ. And I've seen a lot of people who will dig in and study their Bibles. And I've seen a lot of people who will pray. And I've seen a lot of people who will join in together with other believers at the local church. And a lot of people who will go out into the world and tell people who Jesus is. And I've even seen people who surrender their lives to missions. And I've seen people who've surrendered their lives to the ministry. And of all those kinds of people, I've seen every one of those types of people, at some point, some, some version of that, people turn away. And turn their back on God in Christ. And I personally have led people to faith in Christ. And I have baptized people. And I have discipled people who would later decide they don't want to be Christians anymore. And turn their back on Christ. So the reason why I'm saying this is because all of that stuff can be faked. All of it. But there's something that's very, very, very difficult to fake. And that is a life, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, of drawing near to Christ, holding fast your confession, and helping others do the same. Now, I'm not talking about somebody who speaks well of their local church. I'm not talking about somebody who says they love Jesus all the way to their deathbed. I'm talking about the person that is getting beaten in the back by the world and they're experiencing heartache, sometimes even at the hands of the people of the church and they're painfully aware of their own sin and their own struggle in their life, but they keep moving forward. They keep moving forward. They keep holding fast. They keep holding their, con their, their, uh, their confession. They keep drawing near to Christ. They keep helping others do the same. Day in and day out, over and over and over and over. You can't fake that. That is the work of a real Christian who believes in the real work of the real Christ. All right. I'm going to give you all an even shorter version than I gave the last two services because I'm not going to make it through verses 26 through 39 all right so y'all are going to get the abbreviated aided version verses 26 through 31 say this it's another warning passage and basically what it says is if you turn away from these truths you're going to be under the judgment of god and you're going to spend eternity in hell but those of us who belong to christ who believe that his work is greater who draw near to him who hold fast our confession and help others do the same, we can look at verses 26 through 31 and we can say, not me. Not me. And then we can look at verses 32 through 39 where it talks about continuing on, enduring in the struggle, having compassion for our brothers and sisters who are struggling, having confidence in our salvation, enduring, 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 having faith and persevering in our souls all the way to the end. We say, yes, I can do that. I can do that. And so, doctors and businessmen and lawyers and coffee bin roasters coffee bean roasters whatever you do for a living 
you want your work to count for eternity don't quit your job keep doing it but while you are doing that draw close to Christ hold fast to your confession and help others do the same that's the work that matters let's pray Lord what a blessing what an easy job you have given us to simply trust in your work God as we consider you as the greater sacrifice and as the greater high priest and as the great promise fulfilled from God Lord help us to spend our days every single one of our days drawing near to you holding fast and helping others do the same be glorified in us and Lord I pray if there's anyone here who's not begun that process of sanctification they've not trusted you once and for all I pray that you would enliven their minds I pray that your Holy Spirit would reach into their heart now and show them the truth the truth that is Christ so that they may follow and be saved and for the rest of us Lord help us to persevere every day in Jesus name Amen.